Hi, and welcome to this edition of Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva, and it's always a pleasure when we have uh, guests uh, return to uh, pay us a visit, whether in studio or via satellite, or in this case, uh, on the phone. Uh, we have uh, our good friend uh, who joined us uh, about a year and a half ago, a singer, actor, uh, Mel Carter, who's joining us from uh, out in California. Uh, when Mel was here the last time, he had a new CD that uh, had just come out called Mel Carter Continues. And uh, Mel, uh, again, is uh, always busy and always up to new things. And uh, we welcome to Studio 411, return visit, Mr. Mel Carter. Mel, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Larry? It's good to be back. Absolutely. That uh, sounds like a sounds like a song to me, Mel. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, returning engagement. <laughs> I I saw a, uh, a a couple of clips, and I must say, you know, I, I shamelessly sometimes will will borrow a line of questioning uh, based on something I hear or read, which I think is always a good thing to convey to the viewer. But uh, uh, there was a. a a thing recently that uh, I guess when when you were a young man and uh, uh, from your days when you were uh, on Sam Cooke's label uh, and you had uh, a, a hit record, I want to say circa 1962, um, you were asked if you know kind of life changed or if maybe uh, you know the the pressures or different things you know vices that sometimes come with success happen. And I don't know if you remember. Uh, I'm sure you remember the story, but. Uh, the, you told a story, I guess how your, your mom kind of set you straight and, and involved taking out the trash. Do you remember that story? <laughs> yes, uh, we were living in Hollywood then, and uh, I had a, one of Boy Falls in Love was just beginning to hit. And uh, it was the garbage. Uh, I hadn't take, I hadn't set the, the cans out. My mother woke me up right, to uh, take the cans out and, and um, for the garbage man. And, the, the guys came around and said, Mel, Mel, you, man, you're a star. You got, you, you shouldn't be setting cans out. My mother said, no matter who, who you are, you're going to put the garbage out. That's and, right. That's right. Yeah, uh, to keep you level-headed. Oh, I, I, I'm sure you, you probably worked with this young lady when she was very young. As a matter of fact, I think she was underage. Uh, Lala Brooks, uh, I'm guessing you might have worked with her maybe on the old Dick Clark Caravan shows. But uh, Lala Brooks was with uh, one of Phil Spector's bands, and she right. told she told a story one time about how, I guess she kind of like you know snapped at someone uh, uh, just a wee little bit, and her mother, yeah, I guess you know kind of in very short order set her straight and told her if you do that again ever ever, I mean she meant ever when even when she was eighty, <laughs> that she <laughs> that she would never be allowed to go out on tour because in those days because she was underage she had to have you know parental or or some sort of mentorship on on the road with her. And I always remember that story, and it's a good thing. Uh, uh, a lot of a lot of times, grandmothers, mothers especially, they uh, they uh, they know how to keep you in line. So that that's a yeah, good thing. Yeah, my mom was my best friend. And there you go. I miss her very much, but she kept me level-headed all there. the time. <laughs> now tell me now the since we last visited, uh, Mel Carter continues the CD, which again I I still play it all the time as. Uh, has been doing well for you, and uh, uh, now do we have some uh, other projects uh, in the works? Perhaps uh, another CD down uh, down the short pike. What I'm what I'm attempting to do now is finish up the music for the show, the uh, the Legends of Rock and Roll, the Balladeers. Uh, uh, there was such a successful uh, stint when we went to Vegas to uh, do the excerpts from the show. Uh, and I just, just, at first it was more people that we were involved, but when Lenny and I uh, got together and did the excerpts, uh, it just put a thought in my head that we could go on and do this, you know, as, as a duo and uh, make it happen, uh, make it, just make it happen. So that's what I'm working on right now. There you and go. Uh, looking for a concept for the for the uh, of the next album that that we're talking about. Well, I know you you've done some other ones too. You did one before again. Uh, you know, we got a chance to uh, know you and have you on the show. So again, your your stuff and I and I think I'm, I'm I'm paraphrasing a quote that I heard you say is that you do songs that besides the ones of course you write, which are usually four or five on a CD, is that you do songs that are not the American songbook. They're part of a the songbook. It's just not, 
you know, the Gershwins and the Harold Arlens and the, you know, the, the, the folks that are the ones that come right to mind. You do ones that are certainly worthy standard. of being in that. They're, they're standard. Yeah. But they aren't the standard material that everybody uh, records over and over and over and over and over. Right, right. Uh, but they are standard material. <laughs> And that was part of the trilogy. The first uh, CD was the heart and soul of Mel Carter, and then Mel Carter, the other standards, and then Mel Carter continues. And uh, hopefully I'm going to keep continuing to do that. And plus uh, getting, you know, a lot of notification on my writing. That's funny because all the time the B-sides of the singles that I had were songs that I had written. But I, I was never considered, you know, a writer, a uh, songwriter. But now I'm getting that kind of recognition. Oh, your songs are so great. I said, wow, I, I thought they were great a long time ago. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you this. And I, got, I have to admit, of course, I knew you for, you know, two or three of your bigger hits. Of course, Hold Me, Thrill Me, et cetera, et cetera. Back in 65, a, a number one seller, as we've talked about on this show and several others. But... Um, you know, I, I, I was not aware that you were writing. I mean, again, B-sides or not. Obviously, you know, different artists have different things. Some just use the B-side back in the day for, you know, kind of a throwaway, maybe their weakest song, which to me, you know, when you only have 10 or 12 songs, really none of them should be weak. You know what I mean? They should all be like right. considered A-sides, in my opinion. Others, I remember uh, acts like Prince, Elton John came up with this great novelty of having songs that were like unreleased and people would be like, oh man, I got to buy the 45 because you never know what's going to be on the B side, you know? So yeah. that was kind of another way where they'd put live tracks perhaps of songs that people were familiar. Have you ever thought of going back and, uh, I don't know, uh, 10, 20, 30, maybe more, maybe less, taking all the B sides and literally call it, hey, remembering the B sides and then redoing those songs you wrote in the 60s and 70s and perhaps beyond and do them and update them today? Uh, I've never thought about that, but then I'm thinking about some of the titles and some of the uh, lyric content uh, is, well, no, I never thought about it. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, there goes that idea. I thought I had it a great idea. <laughs> well, it is, because I'm looking at one of the things. Now, if you're wondering why I can't be found around the places that I used to go while I'm hiding out in your in my love's arms, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were very story type of sure. material, opposed to, you know, the, the, uh, the material that people write today. Right, but uh, with, with the, especially we talked about the, the great, uh, orchestration and the way you tailored the songs that you've done on the last couple of CDs, most recently, Mel Carter continues. Uh, you know that, I mean, I'm trying to think of a song. Uh, what was that one? Uh, you Keep Me Hanging On. The Supremes did it. A year later, Vanilla Fudge does a version that you'd be like, that's not the Supreme song because they took it and they totally took it to an, a different level altogether. So, right. I have a friend, uh, a very good friend, that uh, took one of, uh, you know, some of the Supreme song and broke them down to pure ballad. And it gives the whole, a whole nother texture to the song. It gives a whole nother uh, reading for, uh, you hear the actual meaning of what the, uh, I think what the writer really meant. Because when you get uh, back in the day, you would caught up into the rhythm of the song. And I don't, I don't think he would pay that much attention to uh, what they were saying. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Mel Carter joining us, singer-actor. Uh, Mel Carter continues the CD. Uh, for more information, uh, website mel-carter.com. Uh, good to have Mel back again. Wanted to spend the hour in addition to talking about the, uh, the things from the CD and, and what you've been up to. Um, love to, because again, even in an hour, sometimes, you know, you're trying to cover like, you know, uh, four or five gener uh, decades of a career. It's always very difficult. And then I find with guests that I've had back on, you know, you talk about some of the people maybe they work with. And in your case, really, we didn't spend a lot of time on the, the acting part of it. And, uh, and again, I heard you say to on a, another interview that, um, I guess, 
many singers back in those days, 50s, 60s, 70s, acting kind of like came as a, an offshoot of their singing career. I mean, some were actors who became singers, but then singers who became actors, if they had any proclivity for, you know, knowing how to act or knowing how to kind of uh, conduct themselves in front of a camera and could get into a script, you know, that was, that was uh, you know, only to their benefit. And, uh, I'm sure you would agree. Well, what, what the uh, record labels did, that when you came, uh, in, uh, were signed and you had a single, you had a hit single, then you would be, graduate to an album artist. They, you know, the album artist w uh, would, are the lasting. They thought, felt that when you make an album that you were a lasting artist. And then the natural progression was if, you, you know, management would take you into uh, uh, the acting field, you know, TV, uh, film, and the commercials. Uh, and if you had that talent, uh, uh, you could, you know, easily go through that. But then uh, uh, there were people who were manufactured and made uh, uh, on that. And, and then if you had that notoriety of being a teenage uh, 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 hit artist, it was only natural for you to go into uh, the visual part of it. That was, the, the acting was, just came natural. Right, I mean, you had those uh, teenage idols, for instance, like Ricky Nelson, of course, he had the, the added benefit that his dad, a former band leader, had his own television show, so naturally that right. came kind of a second nature. And, you know, obviously they got a good 14 year run out of it. Uh, not many have that luxury because, again, not every singer has a, you know, a successful parent or parents that they can kind of, you know, glide into that next phase, you know. So, uh, but now, had you done any, uh, what, what was your, like, um, first uh, stage <laughs> acting or, or kind of acting experience? Did you do any, like, back when you were with the, uh, uh, doing choir work back in the 50s? I, I, I well... We traveled, I traveled around with, you know, the gospel groups, and it, you, when you're before, when you're in front of an audience, I think the uh, uh, the delivery of the music is like an acting experience, you know, uh, getting the audience to believe the lyric content of the song. You know? That's an acting uh, 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 experience, I think, mm -hmm. you know. I think that's the, that's the background that helped me uh, uh, in my music, and then it was only natural uh, to go into to be on stage, and and to be on stage or in front of a camera. It's, it's almost you know the difference is is that you have to worry about blocking. You know that. Sure. <laughs> You, you heard it before we went on the air. Spread your lighting. <laughs> I was doing my Milton Berle imitation. Do this, don't do that. Oh, no, that's right. We can't talk about that now. <laughs> but no, it's, I know what you mean. It takes a lot of, a lot of effort to, uh, you know, to kind of get things in sync to make it look as easy or as, as well done as it should be. And, and believe me, it's not just uh, take your mark, as I'm sure you would, and, and just, you know, let it rip or, okay, give me a mic and I'll sit down behind this desk and, okay, we're just going to go. Things happen, good and bad, and you just have to roll with it. I, I believe that, that singers, you know, with you, uh, were a certain type of singers, you're actors with, mus with a musical accompaniment. Sure. Uh, because as an actor, you have to read some, uh, lines that are written by somebody else. As a singer, you have to sing songs that are written by somebody else, and you have to make that believable. And when you're on stage singing uh, uh, certain singers, you have to really reach that audience. You have to make every individual in that audience believe that you're singing, uh, that whatever you're singing about is just for them. And that's the, the dialogue that you have between two actors uh, is I have to make you believe what I'm saying from something that's written by somebody else, and then I have to study and, and find out what that emotion, how how I can make those words believable and make it you know fit into my character. Sure, and and uh, with acting, uh, play play off of uh, one or multiple people. 
Yes. Whereas with singing, granted, you have to play off your accompanist or your band or whatever you know backing you have. But again, yeah, definitely uh, there's some similarities. But a lot of folks don't make the transition. Obviously, people like Crosby, Sinatra back in the day, and then but then others. And I'm just picking names at random. You know, Tom Jones, Engelbert. You know, later people. Uh, you know, Barry Manilow, whatever, you know, Barry White, you know, that aren't necessarily transitioning uh, in their day I, into I, acting. Add in Johnny Mathis. I always thought, you know, as big as Johnny Mathis was and still is, sure. why he never made that transition into uh, uh, the, uh, the visual aspects. Of, of and he certainly was multi-talented. I mean, I, I think... He was going, or he was competing, but I think at the last minute, maybe his singing kind of derailed uh, his aspiration. He was supposedly going to be an Olympi an Olympian on right, the 1956 right. team, but I think uh, if I have my my story straight, I think probably his career and then probably Columbia probably said, you know, you're a little too busy for that. So you know, but he was like again multi talented in many many different ways. But yeah, ne never saw him do any acting. Uh, at least not to my knowledge. Well, I, have to, I have to tell you how, and uh, the natural thing of going, you know, from singing going into the act, but what made it happen for me more was that I was uh, the victim of the police choke and hold uh, uh, in, in, in a car uh, situation here. Mm -hmm. And I was choked where I, to the point I lost my voice, lost my voice for a year and a half. Wow. And uh, in terms of singing, but then that pushed me more over into the acting. That's, uh, uh, you know, in order to make a living and keep the career going. Sure. But I had lost, I lost the, the use of my voice for almost two years. Wow. So I'm going to say that probably was somewhere in the... Uh like maybe 68, 69, that incident occurred? I, yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, that, that seems to, again, looking at, you know, some of the chronology, yeah, that would, uh, you know, where I see more, you know, TV, uh, you know, film type of things going on as opposed to variety shows. And I have to ask, again, I don't recall the show. Of course, it was uh, uh, in the, in the uh, back in the day, but the Walter Winchell file, was that the first uh, TV work you ever got? I understand you were a parking attendant. Does that role bring back memories? I, I remember, I don't remember if that was the first role, but yeah. I do remember uh, the parking attendant. Yeah. Back in the day, back in the day, <laughs> most of the roles for uh, black artists were policemen, or uh, detectives, or like you said, art. <laughs> no, uh, but I, I did. I, I don't know if that was the first one. I thought it was Marcus Welby. Oh no, the the Winchell thing was 1958. So I mean, Marcus Welby didn't come along till years later. Oh, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Maybe that must that was the first one. They, they must have just stood you up with a cap and said, "Look, look like you're, <laughs> look like you're." Yeah, you caught me. You caught me where I wouldn't look. Where I wasn't looking at the credits. Now. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, I saw the Marcus Welby, and again, uh, I'm just gonna. Uh, we'll get back to that in a minute. We're here with Mel Carter joining us. Uh, return visit from Mel. Uh, the uh, CD Mel Carter continues. Uh, for more information, mel-carter.com. A little later on, we're going to hear a great track uh, with Mel and his buddy uh, Lenny Welch, who uh, we uh, we hope to uh, have on uh, another episode of Studio 411. We wanted to get them both together, but Mel cautioned me. He, he did do me a favor, though. If I ever need a fill-in host or host, we're going to get the two of them on, and I don't even have to show up because the yeah. two of them will just they will just talk for an hour and a half, and we'll have to oh. edit it down to 54 we, minutes. Not only that. Lenny has stories. We both have stories about uh, uh, the club over in Kentucky, which was part of the mob. Oh, say that. <laughs> yes, no, no, don't worry. No one's going to show up. As long as you don't have a cigar in your mouth, no one's going to show up. Uh, you don't want to look like the cover of the Daily News back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, let's segue to talk show and variety shows, shall we? Uh, tell me your thoughts on these gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, some of your experiences back in the day of the talk and variety show. 
Mr. Regis Philbin, who had a, an early incarnation. Uh, I think he took over when Steve Allen left to go do I Got a Secret back in 64, 65. You did Regis' show. What was Regis like back in the day? And also, uh, you were on Joey Bishop with him as well. Yes, I was on Joey Bishop with him, and I was on his show as well. And uh, i got to say that one of, the, one of the Joey Bishop shows I was on uh, with my mom, and my mom and I danced. On, on the show. Nice. Uh, uh, but I was on both. Well, those shows. And that was, yeah, that was back uh, when, when you they were. They were great. Great. Uh, just great to be with. They made you comfortable like you are with me right now. You, They made you comfortable. I, I'm a nervous wreck, <laughs> Mel, so speak for yourself. <laughs> and, and be yourself and, you know, just be crazy and like, uh, uh, the point was is they set you at ease so that, you know, like a, a young performer coming on, you know, like uh, sometimes you would be uh, tense. Well, they had that knack of making you feel relaxed, you know. Well, and, that, and that's the thing. And I was just talking with, with someone who uh, uh, we're working on to get on the show at a later date. Uh, one of the nicest compliments that, that I appreciate is when someone says to me off air, whether it's in studio, usually it's someone in studio. We're, we had one guest on, I'm not going to say who it was, but was so nervous. I mean, it was visibly almost shaking. And I just kept saying to them, you know, what what's, uh, several others had told me. They're like, you know, just act like it's two people like just having a coffee or a drink like in a booth somewhere or at a, you know, a, a restaurant. And next thing you know, you know, the, the best compliment I can get is when a guest goes to me and we roll the credits and they're all clear and everything else. And, and they're like, it, it's over. You know, and they can't believe that that we've done literally, you know, 55 minute show. And then they're like, hey, I told you, you know, it's not it's not that easy, uh, not that difficult. You know, it's just uh, but but thank God she calmed down because I was afraid we weren't going to get through the show. Right. You but know? it's great that you, you, you that you're able to set that the person, the art, or you know, the guest at ease so that they can give out the information, a lot of information, or when you're all tensed up, you you know, things don't come out right. Oh, yeah. It, you yeah. Know, or, it's all bogged up and, and, and uh, it just doesn't work. Reminds me of the old Robert Mitchum story. Robert, who actually was a, 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 a resident or a, a born in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, where I'm from originally, and he was on a show, I don't know, it was Carson or Cavett, and I think it was Dick Cavett, and he was on there, and he just was a guy that didn't realize that he just gave one word answers, you know? So it was like, yes, no, yes, no. So it was like, apparently whoever the interviewer was, it was like the longest 25 minutes of their life. And then at the end they go to commercial and he looks at them and he goes, Oh, did I do good? You know, <laughs> so he just, you know, had no, no concept that they just were not expounding on their answers. And, you know, and that, that's, that's probably the worst, you know, that's probably the worst. Um, let's see now, uh, going to, uh, some of the, the back in the mid sixties when your biggest single came out, hold me, thrill me, kiss me. Um, there were a lot of shows, uh, and I know you were on a couple of them, Hollywood, a go-go, uh, th that, that looked like there was a pretty, pretty hip, uh, crowd there doing that show. Yeah, I can't think of the, the, the host of that show because he had several different shows. Yes, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I can't think of his name either, but he was, he was a uh, California, like, you know, uh, uh, personality out there, yeah. Now, now, did you ever do Lloyd Thaxton? Yes. Okay, yes. Lloyd, yeah. Who, uh, Channel 13. Yeah, yeah, and, and Lloyd was seen here in uh, the New York area on Channel 11, WPIX. I forget if I asked you, did you ever do Clay Cole in New York? I'm not, I'm not sure. No, okay, all right. Um, here's one that I have never seen clips of, and I'm blanking on the host, Chivalry, uh, a, a little-known show that lasted about a year, year and a half. Yeah, who was the host on that show? Do you have any recollection? I, I do, and I can't remember. He just passed away about a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, uh, it'll, it'll come to me. And better. he had a big rate, uh, a, a top... A, Big uh, national top forty radio show okay. as well. All right, yeah, and I, I saw some, uh, you know, real. You know, kinesco. right now when it's, somebody asks me things like that, I said, no, the roller deck is going too far, <laughs> but it probably will stop later on, and yeah. I'll remember. <laughs> but it was just like uh, funny where they came up with these names, like you were on Hullabaloo. Now I assume you did you host the show, or were you just a musical guest? 
No, I was a musical guest okay. on a Hullabaloo. Most of those shows were done here on the world. I've done them several different times because of all the various records. Right. Uh, I had a hit right in a row, and so I was always uh, coming back, coming back. Now, Hullabaloo, I was under the impression, maybe they did some segments in California. I was under the impression they taped in New York City, no? No, I... Shows that we did were out here. We oh, okay, did location. yeah. That was a show that we did most location uh, uh, with. And also now, uh, uh, of course, uh, as I told uh, the the um, the audience uh, on your last appearance, uh, between like sixty three and eighty one. I mean, you were on uh, several uh, Dick Clark uh, incarnations. Uh, uh, did you ever do uh, where the action is back in the mid sixties? Yes, we yeah. got a uh, uh, out in. Um, Santa Monica Beach. We yeah, did, we did a show out, out on the beach. Yeah, the, the, talk about a, a labor of love. I mean, I thought Bandstand was was a you know a, a good production. With that, where the action is, I mean, it was on five days a week, uh, especially in the summertime, and um, uh, it was almost kind of like to give people a feeling of what they missed by not having Bandstand on five days a week the way it used to be before they moved to California. And then when he the, was he was a great guy. I was on bandstand in Philadelphia. Oh, okay, in '63, uh, right? So just right. before, yeah, just before he he went out to the coast. Yeah, you know, it's it's a shame because I know to me, I mean, in his case, the show went on for another almost thirty plus years as a weekly thing. But back in the Philadelphia days, that was we had uh, Bunny Gibson, who I think was gone by that time, but she's an actress and was a dancer, a uh, Philadelphia dancer. Uh, who became quite well known? I mean, you know, very, very popular. Uh, you know, teen magazines or whatever. And all she was was a dancer on the yeah. Dick Clark show. But by being on that show, that propelled her to where she went into the business and became a successful uh, character actress. He had the knack of making you. He was one of the that making you feel totally at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dick traveled on the, you know, the, the the caravan of stars. Yeah. Like, he, he was in the summertime when we'd go on those caravans. He was right on the bus, and every other night we'd stay in the hotel. He he literally spent that time with us. Yeah. And uh, I've I got to applaud him. Uh, we we remained friends for, you know, down to the last Oh, I mean, I know I saw a clip, again, one of those, like you were saying earlier, one of those where you come across it, and it was actually from his archives, and, and I, I digress for a minute. Dick Clark Enterprises, which I think still retains that name, was just sold. Now, you'll, you'll love this, Mel. This would have been a good backer for your show. Uh, it just was sold for $2 billion to some uh, Japanese outfit. Yeah. And, I mean, that is amazing what that man built literally from the ground up, you know, and, and just, uh, but you were on his show as late as the early 80s, and I mean, uh, we showed a clip, I think we still have the clip, uh, we'll pull it up at some point, but I mean, it was great, I mean, he just was a guy that when, when you know, he needed or he thought someone needed him, I, I, I never met the man, unfortunately, but he just seemed like he was there always when people, uh, you know, needed a, a little push or a little promotion, uh, amazing talent. Yeah, and was. and like yourself, he dabbled a little in acting too, if you recall. Yes, he did. But you know, primarily known as uh, the uh, the game show host, uh, Steve Allen. Uh, we had uh, his musical director Don Trenner, who was Steve's director, musical director back in the mid '60s. But late '60s, you were on his uh, one of his uh, syndicated shows. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, uh, the kind of guy he was. A very very uh, talented, very complex gentleman. I, I, when I was on the show, you, you know, a lot of people ask you that, you know, when you're young and, uh, and an entertainer like that, you're much in awe of the people that you're working with, you know, uh, and the people that you're working with when they know that and they, you know, uh, appreciate you as an artist and, and a talent. I think he appreciated me because of the fact that he was such a great pianist and that I was in tune as a vocalist uh, with all the people that he was surrounded uh, by. Uh, and I, I think it was a mutual kind of feeling, <coughs> both of us. Oh. 
Um, something I wanted to ask you, and again, we're talking with Mel Carter, singer, actor. Uh, for more information, mel-carter.com. Uh, the CD Mel Carter continues, and we'll, we'll listen to a track from that uh, at the tail end of the program. Um, you you mentioned to me off air, and we, we talked uh, at length about uh, the balladeers, balladeers, you and Lenny, of course, uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, carrying on that tradition. Um, growing up, or kind of when you think of the term the balladeers, and I, I'm assuming it's male, although it can be male and female nowadays, uh, who are some of the ones that stand out to you, either that you admired or that you feel this is the, you know, if, if I could, uh, could have only aspired or did aspire to reach these heights? You probably mentioned one earlier in Johnny Mathis, but uh, give me a few others that uh, some perhaps still living, maybe some new ones that are considered balladeers that, that you look at and say, wow, that, they, they got it right. Because I sang so high, you know, like I was in tune to the female singers. But if you if you talk about real balladeers, I thought Billy Eckstein was uh, a one. I thought Arthur Prysock was uh, a great balladeer. Uh, I thought Johnny Hartman was one of the premier balladeers. Uh, naturally, there was uh, uh, Frank Sinatra. But, you know, I was fascinated by... Uh, uh, Bing Crosby, mm -hmm. uh, and people would ask, one of, the, uh, and, and, and oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, now I, uh, Bing Crosby, you were talking about? <clears throat> him, I've, uh, uh, as, uh, in, in the way that he, he, it was so effortless for him to deliver a song, you know? Um, I saw Eddie Fisher once, live, mm -hmm. and I thought this man was one of the hardest working men on stage. And uh, I'm not talking about dancing, I'm not talking about movement, I'm talking about just that delivery, and it, it, uh, I was amazed. Well, we discussed when you were on the last time, again, one of the epitome uh, uh, singers, balladeers, whatever, again, uh, that, that did it all, uh, your, uh, your mentor, uh, if I may say, uh, Sam Cooke, what I grew up and always heard about Sam, Sam just planted left foot, right foot, and let it rip. Yeah. You know, there was no flash. Um, he was like Bobby Darren, but without the, the hand gestures. You know, would just sit there, would just stand there or lean or sit, whatever he wanted to do, and would just let it go. And that, to me, was just, it, it was, you know, the, again, the, the, the presence was just, you know, breathtaking. You know, I mean, anyone who could look at that and not say, wow, this, this guy has really got it going on here. And, and that was taken, if you had seen him in the gospel, in a gospel setting, mm -hmm. I mean, he, what we, we call, he killed. He yeah, killed. Yeah. But then there was a there was a guy, the most premier balladeer of, of uh, that I was with, Robert Anderson. And if you hear Robert Anderson, who is a gospel uh, crooner, uh, that's where Sam and a lot of the people got uh, uh, their style and stuff from. You know, at least pieces of it. Sure. But uh, um, my, I loved Dinah Washington. I loved. Sarah Vaughn, I loved the Ella Fitzgerald, because I could sing that high, right. you know, and uh, without any effort. And, uh, but along came Sam when, uh, uh, when we met. I knew him before I went to uh, L.A. and was on his, on his record label. I hear you. All right, Mel Carter joining us here for the hour on Studio 411, mel-carter.com. Uh, going through a variety and talk shows, of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention. And uh, again, I'm surprised I only saw one listing, but uh, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, 1972, and I'm assuming that probably was either just on the New York cusp or out in California, The Tonight Show with... Uh, the great Johnny Carson. Uh, was that New York or was that L.A.? 
No, that was L.A. L.A., okay. So Now, that surprises me was that when that song, uh, uh, which we're, we're looking at a, uh, uh, a photo of the actual 45, ironically, Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, written by Harry Noble, for those of you wondering, and produced and arranged by Nick DeCaro, whose name I've seen quite often in my life, but uh, again, uh, obviously. That was, the, it, that was Nick's first writing assignment. Oh, really? First writing assignment. And it's the most recognizable uh, opening of, of a song, any song uh, that's been out, that string sweep that goes into Hold Me, Throw Me. Yeah. You know, his first writing. So. And, and we're looking at a photo of the actual, what they call the audition record. This was, you know, kind of looks like the actual release, but it just kind of had a white symbol on the old... Uh, Liberty Records subsidiary Imperial, which uh, again yeah. had had a lot of a lot of people on uh, on there back in the '60s. Um, but yeah, Carson. So was that kind of a thing? Did you sit down on the the dais, the couch afterwards, or was just basically sing and uh, get your number in and off you go? I uh, I think the first time well that because the one of the other times uh, Joey Bishop had, uh, was sitting in for him. Mm -hmm. But that on that particular one, I that I sang, just sang. Very good. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the shows you were on again, some of the the great people that you uh, you worked with. But now, as far as um, uh, acting, now again, I'm just going to name a few shows again. Oh, uh, can I interrupt? Sure, you? absolutely. We were talking. We were talking before, and you said, "Had I ever done a uh, Dinah Shore show?" And oh yes, that's it, right. Yeah. And and the funny thing is, I think John Rodby, who is my conductor and the arranger for uh, uh, the uh, my, uh, all of the songs on uh, Mel Carter. Yeah, was he Dinah's? I think he played piano on that show for, for Dinah. I think you're right. That's why I knew the name. I just couldn't place where I knew it from. I think he was her uh, musical, uh, you know, pianist or accompanist, mm -hmm. at least on the you know, the, uh, the, the Diner talk show, not the Diner variety series of the uh, right, right. Uh, early 60s the, the and 50s. Show. Yeah, Diner's place, and then it became just Diner back back then, yeah. How, how was she to work with? Very pleasant lady? Bubbly. Yeah. <laughs> just naturally bubbly. She, very much like she was on camera. There you go. Well, at least one of us is. Okay. <laughs> no, no. Mel is a sweetheart, even off camera. No. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Now, some of the TV work you did. Governor and JJ. My goodness. Dan Daly, Joni Summers. Huh? There's some, uh, uh, you mentioned Marcus Welby with Robert Young and a young James Brolin. I mean, were these people that kind of... You know, you worked on the, the then new Dick Van Dyke show. I mean, when you did these shows, drama, sitcoms, whatever, uh, Sanford and Son, I think I, I, I thought you were on that as well. Yeah. Did these people like know, hey, Mel, how you doing? Or did they not make the connection because you were there in, in really another another kind of facade as an actor? Uh, no, they didn't. They were, uh, I, I think, Red knew me as an uh, artist. Um, a singer. The uh, the rest of the people accepted me as as the actor, and it it, it uh, uh, I've gotten I got return parts because of the fact that I did very well. I gave to them, you know, and that's the part about being an actor. You know, like you 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 put it out, and and they get it, and they, and they see the exchange between one another that makes it real. Now, uh, uh, here's a, a photo, if uh, uh, Dr. Mike, our director, can get a shot of this. This is from the early 80s. This was when Mel, uh, I assume you must add a new album or CD to plug back then, 1981, circa that time, being interviewed by uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Dick Clark himself. Mel looking all sharp in his uh, suit with, uh, with his vest and just looking real dapper. Um, I just wanted to bring that to uh, the audience attention because again, there's there's a shot of uh, Dick Clark again. You know, as the years go on, people will be like Dick who? You know, his name is still on top of the Rock and New Year's Eve. By the way, I just say that, <laughs> even though he's no longer hosting it, Dick still uh, still is uh, is with us. I know us. there's some when you talk to some of some of the younger people, they don't even know who the Beatles are. You know? uh, yes, uh, scary. I know, I know. That's a uh, uh, what was it? To digress a minute, I went to see um, 
uh, not long ago the uh, the film Sully with uh, Tom Hanks, based on the uh, gentleman who right. landed the plane in the uh, on the Hudson there, quite successfully without any loss of life. And uh, and granted, I know the first one was twenty some years ago. Uh, I was in the presence of a group of young people, and they didn't know who Forrest Gump was. And I said, okay, I'll give them a pass, because that was 20 years ago. You know, they probably weren't even born. But what amazed me with all the technology, and I know I sound like a grumpy Gus, but that's fine, is that th with all this technology, they did not know that in 10 years or less, w since that occurred with Sullenberger, uh, landing the plane on the Hudson, that um, uh, they did not know who the uh, real life person was. And I'm saying we have all this, you know, the iPhones, the computers, we have this, and and I'm like, I just soak all that stuff in like a sponge. But you know what, I guess, I guess other people just, I don't know what they're into, but you know, that's for another show. <laughs> well, uh, it just shows you that a lot of people just aren't interested in what's happening or they don't retain. I guess, yeah, but I mean... I mean to, we think to, about it, we can remember things that happened to us like 40, 50 years ago. Sure. Uh, and it, it was... They're, they're doing... Oh, in my apartment building, they're redoing an ap apartment for uh, Florence Greenberg, who was the owner of Sep Scepter Records. Okay. Oh, yeah, the uh, Dion Warwick's and, label back in the day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So... so so we were on the elevator. I was on the elevator with, with some of the work. I said, you're working hard. I said, yeah, we're back. We're doing this uh, on your floor, just like uh, similar to your apartment. I said, yes, I knew, I knew a lady that uh, was in that apartment, came out here to stay. And uh, some, and I said, way before you were born, <laughs> when I was thinking about it, he's not, I said, it was like 40 years ago. He's not 20, you know. And, and uh, he, he remembered or didn't remember? <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't remember. No, because I, I stopped in the middle of the sentence and I said, I knew the... Li I said, oh, not to worry. That was before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one more point on, on some of your acting gigs. And I, I noticed a trend and I don't know, it just could have been coincidence, but you were saying before about, you know, a law enforcement people or medical people. Shows like Quincy, Trapper John... Chips, Magnum PI, it's a Hunter. It's interesting. You you definitely did play people in those kind of genre shows. You know, I noticed that now that you you mentioned that to me. No, the uh, I can't. Oh. Plus, you also Never did mind. a great one with David Cassidy called "Man Under." David, yeah, I was thinking about that. Man <laughs> there, Under there's a show that's forgettable. I got to tell you. But it was a good he was, paycheck. He was a, so. he was a teen pop star. No, I know, but that was after already the Partridge family, and, and the show really, I don't think it lasted a year, but it was just, you know, hey, it's a gig, you know, you, you do the gig, just like if it was a singing gig, you play the club, and as long as you get paid, that's good, but I just, when I saw that, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I said, I hadn't heard about that series in 1979, and Mel was only I think one of the guys I had a lot of fun with was Jack Klugman. Oh, on Quincy, yeah, he's, uh, I have never heard a... Uh, except from perhaps maybe his ex-wife, <laughs> uh, I've never heard a bad story about uh, Jack Klugman. I said very, and actually, uh, you did a second show with with Jack. Are you aware of that medical show? Yeah, yeah I'm, you, uh, it, it was a medical show. You did, and Quincy I remember. MD. I, I remember the story uh, uh, when I came in one day, and they had all of these medical terms, da da da, and we were, you know, had to uh, get them out right fast you know, to roll them up. And he said, he, he took the script and he said, listen, let's take this out, this out, this out. These people are not going to understand what these uh, uh, terminology. And he said, we certainly don't understand by shooting them back and back. So he crossed off. Like, oh, so he was he was kind of uh, e editing the script as well and making yeah, changes. Good yeah. for him. Good for and him. he liked he. Uh, I, I think one of the uh, one of the things he liked me because I, we had uh, comedic uh, timing between the two of us. So I got to do the show, uh, you know, several different times. That's good. Yeah. No. Of course, uh, Jack, best known for the uh, Odd Couple, but then uh, hit it quite uh, quite big with uh, Quincy MD. Now, there's a show listed on here, and I thought it was a Jack Klugman short-lived show, a show called You Again. Was that Jack as well? 
I don't th I think was uh, that you, Jack and John Stamos played his kid? I don't think. No. Okay. I, I thought know that it was John was Stamos. Yeah. I don't think it was Jack. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, then I got it mixed up with another another show. We're looking at a shot too. I know uh, we showed it the last time you were here of uh, Dick Clark Caravan of Stars again. Uh, just you know, phenomenal. You know, everybody did their two or three songs. You know, Peter and Gordon, the Drifters, Ian Whitcomb, Jackie DeShannon, the Crystals, Brian Hyland. I mean. Uh, a, a treasure trove of people, uh, many of whom are still with us in one way, shape, or another, and uh, just good stuff. In our remaining moments, uh, quick answers. Uh, let's see. Oh, my goodness. Best advice you ever got from a career standpoint? The best advice? Uh, other than doing this show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got me on that. Okay. <laughs> How do you, how do you relax? Uh, my re I walk. Okay. That, uh, <clears throat> that's the best thing for me is uh, walking because it clears up my mind and walking early in the morning. There you go. And power walking. I, w I was hoping I was going to remember, and we just had this shot come up, and I don't think I asked you the last time. There's a shot here, and we don't have time to dissect who the ladies were, but there's a marvelous shot of you in a tuxedo with – the great late Marvin Gaye. Uh, tell me, uh, uh, tell me a little bit about Marvin Gaye. Cause you don't run across a lot of folks that, that even met Marvin. Marvin is was a great. Uh, uh, we became friends when we. Uh, I was at a club. He was at a club called the Cave, and I was at a club called Izzy's up in uh, in Canada. And uh, it was like during the first part of his when he was doing the transition from the rock rock into the nightclub thing mm -hmm. and we used to talk back and forth over the phone about how how uh how to make it easier or how he could calm himself down you know uh you know for that but now, now he like so many others i i just recently learned uh Teddy Pendergrass, like Marvin, was actually started out as a drummer and then evolved into the singer. You know, they found, hey, man, you can sing. Get out here, you know. And it just, I find that amazing that, you know, and, and some of them had gospel roots. But, you know, Marvin, for a person that's considered such a genius back in his, uh, his short life, seemed like, a, a, not to quote one of his tunes, but seemed like a troubled man. Uh, I don't know that that part about him mm -hmm. uh I, I i just know that it was the, the friendliness that we uh had between each other was because of the fact that he was just entering into that kind of uh showbiz genre you know where where you, you know making the transition uh the same as sam when he made the transition from the gospel to the going into the nightclub uh uh, it, 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 and I was already in it, so right. there was that conversation that we would have about how, you know, how, uh, how to relax, how to really, you know, like, go in and, and, and make it happen. Um, we talked earlier about the track we're going to hear in a few moments from uh, the CD, The Legends of Rock and Roll, along with uh, you and uh, Lenny Welch, but uh, have you given any thought to maybe uh, doing at some point a... Uh, uh, a duet CD, perhaps with some of your uh, idols or some folks that up and coming or folks that you say, hey, you know, we've known each other for years. We've never worked together before. Yes, I've, I've thought about that quite a lot. And I've, I've thought about maybe even some of the, uh, the contemporary uh, people that are out now, if I could get, you know, uh, to do a duet with uh, some of them. Know. And I've always wanted to. I, uh, in in the past, I've done things with Martha Reeves. Uh, I've done. Uh, mm, I saw a clip of you recently with, I guess, Peter some of Bain. the some of the Supremes. Uh, Was that a gig that you guys did, or did you actually record something? They background me in the first stint that I did at the uh, uh, Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. Wow. And was that Mary Wilson or some of the later Supremes? That was the later Supreme, but I worked with the Supremes in in Detroit uh, when I had a record called "I'm Coming Home." It was a Doris on the Doris Day's label, mm -hmm. you know, and that that was way before I came uh, out here. And uh, Jean Terrell, I bet you was she one of the ones that you worked with. She was one of the. She took over when Diana Ross left the band. 
Well, when uh, when I first went to uh, at at the Flame Show Bar, I think it was at the Flame Flame Show Bar. That was the original Supreme. Oh, the the first time around, and then later on, it was the uh, uh, some of the the ladies that were were there after Diana left. After yeah, sure, ladies of the Supreme. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as we're winding down, bucket list trip. Where would you like to go, Mel? If I handed you the money, where where have you thought about and have never gone, despite your world travels? I'd like to go to Sydney, Australia. There you go. There you go. See, I, I see an opera house in Mel's future. Here we go. <laughs> Him and Lenny doing it, doing a tour in Australia. There you go. And we just have to find uh, someone to bankroll that puppy. I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah, I had a big commercial that happened there. They they took uh, uh, one of the beer commercials they used. Hold me, throw me. This nice. There you go. All right. Theme. And I never got a chance to go there. And I wanted there you go. Well, Mel, again, we're we're going to have you back on. Of course, uh, one of my favorites to uh, talk uh, uh, about stuff and uh, just a marvelous career and more to come. And uh, right now we're going to give the uh, viewers a treat. We're going to listen to uh, a track from Mel Carter Continues. Mel Carter joining us here on Studio 411, mel-carter.com. The Legends of Rock and Roll, a duet with Lenny Welch. Uh, Mel, hang in there with us. And again, my thanks for uh, joining us, and uh, we look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you, and thank your audience. Absolutely. All right, and we thank you for joining us here on Studio 411. Larry De Silva, wishing you the best, and we look forward to having you again with us next time. And here are Mel and Lenny taking it downtown with The Legends of Rock and Roll. Take care. Those were happier times When we were free in our minds That's when we became The legends of rock and roll Some of us may have gone To that great beyond But the songs that we sang Will live on and on The songs made you happy then They make you feel we're the legends of rock and roll Remember when we danced through the night Holding your baby real tight Whispering love talk in her ear Today on the dance floor You can't hold her close anymore And whispering becomes a scream but we'll go on Singing our love songs Putting the magic Into your heart You can't keep that rock music For we're not into that You can't keep the hip-hop hopping Cause we don't stand for that We'd rather sing our love songs Back in the day when the balladeers, we, used to come out on stage. Oh, yeah. The women would scream and yell and, <laughs> and, and throw their keys and their, all sorts of things. They would throw on stage and then we would swoop down and pick them up and be glad about it. <laughs> Amen. Ah, oh, but nowadays when they throw stuff on the stage, mm -hmm. we swoop down and... <laughs> Help me up. All right. Get up. Somebody, somebody help me up. Get up, get up. Hey, come on, I hey, got you, I got you. Come I got on you. and help me up now. I got you, I got you. Come on, brother, I got you, I got you, I got you. You can't keep 